Hi Ninjaners, in this video we're going to be talking about cataracts. If you like this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up, comment down below, and don't forget to subscribe. Also check out ninjaner.org where we have our notes and illustrations for every lecture that we put up here on YouTube, and it's a really great source for you guys. Let's get into it. So we're going to be talking about cataracts, and when we focus on cataracts, what we're specifically talking about is the lens, and specifically that the lens opacity increases. And you're probably like, what the heck are you talking about? What does that mean? And it's from when the lens goes from a clear view to a cloudy view. So let's quickly run through these two diagrams here of the eye, because we're talking about the eye and we're talking about our vision. And we're going to just go through these structures, reorient ourselves with these diagrams so we know what we're talking about. So that way we can understand cataracts way better. So quickly, we're just going to go through here. We have this layer that's protecting the outside of our eye, which is our cornea. We have the coloring of the eye, which is what we call the iris, which contracts and dilates to allow light to go through. And that light goes through the opening, which is the pupil, which we don't have drawn here, but it would be right in here. Then we have our retina, which is our layer back here, which takes that light that goes through the eye, makes it into a signal, sends it down the optic nerve to our occipital, into our brain, and that's how we get our vision. So let's understand here really quickly. We have all these different layers and we have a sagittal view of the eyeball, and we have a clear and a cloudy. And what we need to understand is how the light just goes through the eye really quickly, and that's going to help us understand then how cataracts affect our vision. So when we have light, a light source, say right here we have a little sun or a flashlight, something, it's creating our light source is going to go through our cornea, because our cornea is a clear opening, right? We have all of our aqueous fluid up here. Our iris is dilated or opened enough so that we can get through that pupil and we go through the pupil, through the lens, and then back onto our retina. And once we have that image on our retina that's actually inverted, the retina makes that image into a signal, sends that signal to our brain, and then allows us to understand what we're seeing. And this is great for the lens, right? The lens is clear, the vision and light is going through, and we're able to interpret what we're looking at. And we need our lens to be clear so that we can see an image. But if we have one that's cloudy, it's not going to allow as much light through, or it's not going to direct that light into an area that's pinpointed. So when we have light come through and it's either scattered a little bit, or we have some other issues with our vision, then we're not going to be able to have a clear picture. And that's what a cataract is. A cataract is this cloudiness or this opacity that is increasing in our lens. But how does this occur? Like, what the heck? It just becomes cloudy. Like, what is that? So our lens is made up of epithelial tissue, just like our skin. And unfortunately, when it is damaged, it, doesn't, it can't just like schleff off anything. So what we need to do is we need to replace that. But how does it occur first? How does that cataract occur? What we have is the denaturing of these proteins. We have proteins within our, our lens, and these proteins when they denature means they go from a folded to an unfolded structure. And what does that mean? What, what Denaturing, what does that mean? Denaturing means there's a breakdown of the protein. So there's weak bonds within the protein or there's some type of outsta outstanding circumstance, something that goes in to damage the protein, like UV light, for example. And as that denaturing occurs, they become unfolded or they're not as folded as they would like to be. And then they can coagulate. And when between that denaturing and that coagulation is where we get that cataract or that cloudiness. And over time, as it builds up, that cloudiness increases, increases, increases. And then now we have a cataract that is very visible where we can't maybe even see or could lead to blindness. But the good thing is, is that cataracts are progressing and they are a progressing type of disease. So what we can do is we catch it early. We can't necessarily treat it at that point, but we can prevent the progression. So what are causes or how does this all occur? The causes of cataracts, first, I want you to understand is it can happen in both eyes. It just happens faster in one than the other. But there's many different processes that can make cataracts occur. One of them is just aging. You just become older. You have a water loss within the lens. You have a decreased water within that lens. Therefore, you have a decreased area for that coagulation to occur. So it creates a denser coagulation, denser coagulation of the proteins, and then you have a cloudiness. You also have hereditary. There are some forms of cataracts, and there's many different forms that we aren't going to hit on specifically, but there is one where you can be born with it. 
There is secondary to any type of disease process, particularly diabetes or any type of medication used like steroids, particularly corticosteroids. UV light exposure from the sun, not wearing the correct eye gear, and then also injury or trauma to the eye. So all of these can cause cataracts within the eye. So now we are not seeing a nice clear vision, we're seeing this cloudy or blurry vision. And we need to think about prevention first, because if we have a patient that's been going to routine eye exams and they're just saying that their vision's a little blurry, we're able to maybe say, hey, this might be an early sign of cataracts forming. These are some things that you need to do in order to prevent the progression. If, if not, it can progress into blindness and then we may have to do surgery in order to alter and change the lens out. So what are some things that we can teach our patient to prevent? Cataracts. We can tell them to wear sunglasses or a hat that can help them shade from the UV light. We can tell them to schedule regular eye exams and then also when they are reading to wear reading glasses, use magnification so they can either use a magnifying glass or there is big print books out there that patients can um, get and they can read a lot easier because it'll be a bigger print and also adequate lighting when they are reading. So we have a patient who may be progressing or may not and we need to understand what are we going to be looking for or how would that patient present to us if maybe we think, hmm, they might have cataracts or the other way around, this patient has cataracts, they probably have these signs and symptoms. So let's go into our assessment and talk about how we would go through our patient and find out do they have cataracts and how bad is it. All right, engineers, so we're going to talk about the assessment or what patient may come in and present with what we think are cataracts or either they have cataracts and these are the signs and symptoms that I'm going to be looking for. So with a patient, they're going to come in and maybe complain of blurred vision or decreased color perception because remember we're going to have that lens that's a little cloudy. It's having trouble pushing light through into the back of our retina so we're able to see a nice clear image. So therefore the vision might be blurred and then you're going to assess them. You're going to look at the eye as well, make sure there's no drainage or swelling or anything like that that's around the eye, any type of redness. But we're also going to be asking them about their vision, particularly are they having any halos or issues with driving at night? Are they having any glares when they're driving? Because remember, this is gradual, so this might be something that some patients say, oh, I've had that all the time or I've had that for the last 12 years, it's just worse now. Or they may say, you know, this I didn't really notice, I wear glasses, my glasses have kept going up in their prescription. So remember, it's going to be gradual. So what are other things that we can ask them? We can ask them, are they having any type of double vision or diplopia? We're going to go and assess them, probably do a visual acuity test. And the visual acuity is the Snell and eye chart, the chart that we use in order for the patients to read so we can get what their eyes are reading at with and without corrective lenses. So if they have glasses, we can do it with and without. And we're gonna try to see if their visual acuity is reduced. This is great if patients do go to the eye doctor or they do come often to your facility and you're able to see a visual acuity maybe from a year ago or two years ago. And we can see how that possibly has changed or has not changed. We're also gonna assess them for their red reflex. Remember when we assess for the red reflex, this is the same thing that we used to have back in the day. If you were you know, around when there used to be film cameras and not just everything digital, film cameras were often had a flash and that flash would create someone with a red eye. That red eye is basically the red reflex and what we're doing is we're using a light to flash through the back of the eye to see if we can get a reflex from that light. And if we aren't, that means that light isn't getting refracted as nicely and we're not getting a reflex from the back of the retina. You can also assess different colors of it as well. Then we're also going to look directly into the eye, just with our own eyes, and see is the pupil looking cloudy or white. You can actually see it. If the cataract has progressed so far, you can actually see the cloudiness just by visually assessing their eye. With all that being said, the doctor will then diagnose the patient, and they typically use a slit lamp, which is this ability, this magnifying glass that allows them to look into the structure of the eye as well as layers, and they can determine if the patient has cataracts. If the cataract is preventable, again, we're going to talk about those prevention measures like wearing sunglasses, hats, things like that. But if it is so far along that they possibly need surgery, then we're going to have to do some of our nursing teaching and our nursing expertise. And remember, anytime we mention surgery, we're always talking and clarifying that the patient has their consent signed and it's NPO. Typically, surgeries for cataracts are outpatient. 
and the goal is to basically remove the affected lens. How we do that is we make a really small incision, we insert, what we do is we insert this little mechanism and we use, I would say it wrong, so phaco emulsification, pretty sure that's how you say it, which is when you put in little vibrations, it helps break up the lens into little pieces, we pull those pieces out and then within the lens capsule, put in a new intraocular lens. And that new intraocular lens is nice and clear and it's great. So the way we need to do that for surgery, what we need to pre-teach our patient particularly is first about the medication. So there's gonna be eye drops, sometimes before surgery and, and long after surgery, that the patient's gonna have to administer themselves and we want to, or a family member. So we wanna make sure that we are able to teach them or at least give them what they need to know about administering eye drops. So the biggest thing is for them to make sure they wait that five minutes between drops, especially if you're using different types of medications. Just like you as a nurse, when you're giving medications IV, you don't just push one right after the other. There's always a flush in between. Same thing with the eyes. So when we put in the eye drop, we're gonna wait that five to 10 minutes between. We also wanna make sure that they avoid touching the bottle tip to the eye because we don't wanna contaminate the medications. They're gonna wash their hands before and after. They're going to pull down right on their cheekbone, pull down and expose their conjugal sac. And then what happens then is we just drop some drops into the sac, close their eye, move their eye around. If it is some type of medication that we don't want to get into systemic circulation, we really want it to stay into the eye, typically something like a beta blocker. We wanna make sure that we also apply punctal occlusion, which is then when we press really lightly right here on the lacrimal punctual so that we're able to not let that fluid and that medication go out into the systemic circuit, stays right in the eye and does what it needs to do in the eye. So with those eye drops, we're gonna be giving them medications. They may be giving them to themselves early in the morning. And these medications will do a couple different things. We have some that can prevent the pupil constriction. So prior to surgery, we're gonna be making sure that the eye is nice and dilated so we have a nice open space in order to get that lens out. You wanna make sure you're telling your patient that this will make them sensitive to light as well as getting an eye surgery. So you just wanna make them aware that that is gonna be something that happens and they should have sunglasses or go somewhere dark. And if you've ever had your eyes dilated, I unfortunately have, it is excruciating how sensitive light is when your eyes are extremely dilated. It's not fun. So I highly advise having something, just even on something to put over your eyes. The patient will have an eye patch, so hopefully that will help them as well. There's also gonna be drops that can relax the eye muscles. Now your eye muscles are of similar type of um, muscle that can also be susceptible to other medications like Flomax or Tamiflucin. So you wanna just make sure you're checking your patient's chart or asking them if they have been a large prostate, if they are taking any type of Flomax or Tamiflucin. So that way we can let the patient, or let the doctor know that the patient's taking that because this medication works very similar and then we can have some type of issues with the patient. They also, may, after surgery, will be giving themselves antibiotics or even pain medication, analgesics, into their eye to be able to you know, help them heal after surgery and prevent infection. The biggest thing you also want to teach them is that we want them to, especially after surgery, is to prevent or at least keep interocular pressure low. And why is that? Well, they had an incision in their eye. So if they increase interocular pressure, that incision has a chance to open up, right? Or bust open and we don't want that to happen. So what are some things that we can teach our patient prior to surgery? We wanna let them know that, you know, bending over, coughing, any type of straining. When we say straining, we're talking about bearing down, going to the bathroom. So maybe they should have some stool softeners on hand if needed any rubbing of the eye or heavy lifting. So if they have any jobs that also indicate any type of this movement and they're gonna have to take off work, that's also important. And you wanna make sure that they also have a ride home after surgery. If these patients are going to be outpatient, they're gonna need that ride home. And you wanna make sure that it's there for them. But the patient goes and has surgery and maybe they have some other outstanding circumstances where they can't go home. Maybe they have some other issues going on with them and comorbidities. So what we need to do is also keep an eye on how our patient is in the hospital and also teach patients at home. So after surgery, you wanna make sure that your head of the bed in the hospital is 30 to 45 degrees, or if they're going home, they at least maybe are sleeping on two pillows. Again, this is to decrease the interocular pressure or just have them sitting up a little bit so the pressure doesn't go to that surgical site in that eye. There's also the eye patch. You wanna make sure when they're sleeping, they're wearing this eye patch 
and they can also lay on their unaffected side, again, so that way the pressure isn't building up in that eye. This is also important for infection and that just that offhanded chance that they are absentmindedly watching something or sleeping and they're not really paying attention, their eye itches and they go to scratch at it. The eye patch is there just to help prevent that. It also could be an eye shield, not necessarily a patch. Really just depends on what facilities have. There's also safety, and this is the biggest portion of the post-op for our patient. Besides that um, infection control, we wanna make sure that they are safe. Remember, they got surgery on their eye, especially if it is their first cataract done and they still have to get the other eye done. Now they got a cloudy cataract on this side and an eye patch. So are they really gonna be able to be seeing very well? Probably not. So we wanna make sure we're telling our patients, hey, I'm gonna put your belongings on your non-operative side. So I'm gonna put your belongings on this side. Here's your phone, here's your call bell, here's, you know, orient them to their surroundings because this is a new surrounding for them. We wanna make sure that maybe we assist them too with ambulation, especially for the first couple, just to make sure that, you know, you're checking out your patient, you're like, okay, they know where the bathroom is now. They don't have to keep the eye patch on all the time, but if they are somebody who absentmindedly forgets, maybe it's something to encourage to keep on for a little longer. If the patient does go home or when they do go home after surgery and their post-op stay, Big things we want to keep in mind to teach them and look out for on the NCLEX or any type of exam that we take. First is we want to make sure, again, that preventing of constipation or any type of increasing in that interocular pressure. We don't want them lifting anything heavy. We don't want them straining, coughing, bending over, rubbing their eye. We want to make sure they're wiping from inner to outer. So if they see any drainage, it should decrease as the eye heals and they shouldn't be getting more drainage, should be getting less. They want to make sure they wipe it from inner to outer. And if there's any itching or discomfort, that is normal. But if it does progress into pain, to call their health care provider. We also want to make sure the big things, if there's a decrease in vision, if it's severe eye pain, if there's any signs of infection, like the redness, the discharge that is purulent, or there's bleeding from the eye, you want to make sure that you're calling your health care provider, letting them know, getting in, being seen. And the last is if they start developing any flashers or floaters that means there's something else going on with that that lens that it maybe isn't hearing right there's some other problems going on in that eye and we want to make sure that we help the eye out before any more damage is caused to it all right ninja nerds in this video we talked about cataracts and the nursing assessment and care i hope you guys liked it and as always until next time